We have victory over Assyria in chapters 36 and 37 of that interlude. And then uh, Hezekiah's sin with Babylon in chapter 38 and 39. The second section of Isaiah is where we start today. This is a, a contains a lot of really important verses, but when we look through, especially in, in the 51st, 52nd, 53rd chapters of Isaiah, then you start talking uh, about the suffering servant, um, Jesus. And it's very vivid as far as its description of how and why uh, Jesus died. And when you, you look at that fulfilled in the New Testament, it becomes abundantly clear just how uh, accurate the, this prophecy was concerning Jesus. Um, this is one of the parts about the Messiah that the, the Jews really didn't have a full grasp on as far as what to expect the Messiah to be like. Um, a lot of the interpretations had two different people. There's a, 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 a Messiah, and then there's this person that they're talking about in, in Isaiah. And the, they did not, for the most part, associate this person who was suffering uh, with the Messiah as an individual. It was often translated to mean something more national. It, it represented the nation rather than a person. Um, but the uh, Isaiah is, is obviously talking about Jesus and on the cross in his uh, prophecies in chapter 53 especially. Um, and then in chapters 58 through 66, the end of, of Isaiah um, is future. Oh, the future glory. Again, remember that Isaiah is prophesying well before years, uh, 100 years before they're taken into captivity, 150 before Babylon. But the, the theme of Isaiah is partial judgment towards current Israel because of their sin. And then also he prophesies hope for those who are the remnant. Okay, and that hope is all centered around the Messiah and his future Jerusalem and, and, and that sort of thing, the future glory. So it's, in Isaiah's mind, it seems like it's a done deal. It's going to happen. You know, the, the, the point of repentance has kind of ended, it seems. But God always allows, uh, as he, it, it seems like time, he allows time for the nations to repent. Whenever Noah was started building the ark, I mean, God gave him 120 years to repent while he built the ark. You know, and it was an obvious failure on not God's part, not Noah's part, who preached righteousness, uh, but on the part of the people who did not accept the word of God and then make preparations for it. But the same case is for Israel who are blinded to the truth because of their sins and the hardness of their heart and they're being led by false teachers blind and deaf and just you know they're destined for for captivity and so when we look through again the first 39 chapters it deals with the Assyrian threat and then the second half of, of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66, deal with Babylon. So the point of this section is deliverance from Babylonian captivity. In Isaiah 40, in verse 31, it reads... But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. 
they shall walk and not faint. And all of this is uh, are for those who wait on the Lord. Okay? Those who wait on the Lord or worship God are those who are uh, to expect this, this kind of deliverance or hope. So when we look at chapter 40, we look at the greatness of God to comfort the people. The, the preceding announcements of Bab Bab Babylonian captivity, um, you know, if, if somebody came in and prophesied that, you know, Russia was going to come in or another nation, you know, and come and take over and then take the people away, and you knew this ahead of time, you know, the, the general attitude and feeling towards that would be, I think, fear. Um, a lot of fear and a lot of denial. Of course, on Israel's part, there was a lot of denial. But it's needed and, and will be given to those people. Now, he didn't just leave them with this announcement of desecration or, or exile without any question or, or, or any answer about what's going to happen then at next, you know, is God still, has God abandoned us? You know, and I'm sure that's what was on a lot of their minds, is that God, you know, has he abandoned his people? You know, has he broken his promise? And, and this is a reassurance that says, no, God is faithful, he hasn't broken his promise, he remains with those who worship him, and that's who this, this comfort is directed to. And so three things are addressed to Jerusalem, which outline the rest of the book. God speaks comfort to Jerusalem, better days under the Messiah, and then when we look at the first two verses, Or, I'm sorry, the next, starting in verse 12 in chapter 40, the prophet, as he does, he shifts to better days under the Messiah in verses 3 through 11. And with the captivity as in the background, then he starts talking about the comfort that, that comes from the Messiah. Um, what is interesting is he talks about in verse... Uh, 3 and 4 of chapter 40, it says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And that sounds very familiar because that's exactly what's in the very beginning of the New Testament. Okay? The New Testament is the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy that is made in Isaiah. The, 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 the predecessor to the Messiah, the one who is going to come and prepare a way in the desert, you find in Matthew 3 and in verse 3, where it quotes this section from Isaiah. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And who is he talking about? John the Baptist, the John... In those days, it starts in chapter 3, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, So Isaiah 40 is where that comes from. And Isaiah is, is you know, with captivity uh, in mind for current Israel of Isaiah's day, he talks about a future of Israel um, that is defined by these various aspects. And one of them is that there's going to be someone to prepare the way of the Lord, uh, a predecessor. Um, and he starts talking about the glory of God and the glory of the Lord and the truth that, that is going to come uh, from, from him. And so it brings us to uh, verses 12 through 31. Again, we talk about God's
comfort. And in, in these verses, it has, it talks a lot about the character of God. Um, the character of God. So let's read a little bit of it. And he asks these rhetorical questions about God. Um, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or, has, or, ha, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Now, what's the answer to that? No one, okay, himself, right? These are questions, you know, when we think about these, these questioning God, um, God putting himself in comparison here with uh, idols, you know, he's putting himself in comparison with, with those things that are made by men's hands, who are mute, um, who, who are deaf, um, and this is language that you find throughout the Old Testament. You'll find it in Kings. You remember Mount Carmel and uh, the uh, prophet uh, Elijah was, was challenging the, the prophets of Baal. And they did their thing, danced around the fire. They poured water on. Uh, they, couldn't even, they couldn't get you know, their false god to come and... and and make and light their sacrifice, and then Elijah has them douse the uh, the sacrifice three times with with water overflowing the the moat around it, and then God, you know, sends his fire, and you know it's this awesome spectacle of God is real, God is great, He takes action, He's in control, and then all the idols are really amount to nothing, and they're not even real, um, and so this is an ongoing biblical issue in the Old Testament. Um, also, this questioning God, you find uh, what I think is, is interesting, the language it is found in Job 36 also. Uh, if you turn over to uh, Job really quick. Job 36, and in verses 22 and 23, you also find this kind of questioning, these rhetorical questions. This is when Elihu reminds Job of the greatness of God. It says in verse 22, Behold, God is exalted by his, who teaches like him, who has assigned him his way. Or who has said, you have done wrong. Remember, to magnify this work of which men have sung, everyone has seen it. Man looks on it from afar. And so, this same kind of question, who taught God justice? Who taught God knowledge? Who, uh, who taught him the way of understanding? Um, and then he says, behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. You know, pretty insignificant. Um, and are counted as the small dust on the balance. And then it just goes on to say about how small and, and insignificant are all the nations. In verse 17, all nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom will then, then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds a graven image. The goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not potter. And so he's he's going on about the, the this the futile actions of those idol worshippers, the ones who create idols, and for what purpose? 
You know, what purpose do the idols serve? Um, compared to the true and living God who knows all things and, and sits above and, and controls all things. And he, he talks about this quite a bit through chapter 40. But then at the end of chapter 40, in verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So man will fall. Even young, strong warriors are, are suffer from weakness and thirst and eventually age, but compared to, to that, those who wait on the Lord renew their strength. Of course, he's talked about the spiritual aspect of worshiping God, you know, versus no benefit of worship, worshiping the idols whatsoever. It's a comparison between that which is fake or false and that which is real or spiritual. And so compared to all the things of the world, uh, <coughs> he, is, he is far above all these things. Is there any comments up to this point? In chapter 41, the challenge is made. God can foretell the future, but can the gods of the nations? And then you're going to find some pretty interesting prophecies that are going to come up pretty soon. Uh, God is described in chapter 40. Uh, he foretells the rise of Babylon. And then he foretells the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Persians. And so the question is raised, who else can do this? Who can, who can foretell the future can the gods of the nations foretell the future and when he asks these things he gives the examples of the one who is coming from the east and later he's going to name that person in chapter 43 I'm sorry chapters 44 and 45 um, Let's, see. Let's look at the beginning of chapter 45. It says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings. And without you know a fundamental understanding of world history or of this point, you could you could miss what's being said here. Isaiah lived 150 years before Cyrus did, and he's mentioning this ruler who's going to come from the east uh, and from the north and defeat the Babylonians. And you know what? What other reassurance do you need of, of the divine nature of? Of God, other than the fact that He has uh, prophesied in detail about names and, and where they're going to come from, and uh, but the, the point of, of that is, and back in chapter forty-one, when that question is raised about who can foretell the future, uh, the answer is obvious: no one can. 
Um, God announces to the nations that one will rise from the east in the first seven verses of chapter 41. And then the question is raised in verse 4. Who has performed and done it? Calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. Um, God is the first and the last. Um, he's the Alpha and the Omega. You don't, you don't hear the words Alpha and Omega until you get to the New Testament, because we're, we're not in the Greek yet, but that's essentially what's being said. He is the everlasting God. He knows all things, and he... Uh, you know, as far as knowing what's going to happen and knowing the future, nothing is withheld from his knowledge. Uh, the answer to, to verse to this question, who has performed and done it, is God. And then when we look at verses 5 and 6 and 7 of chapter 41, the coastland saw and feared it. The ends of the earth were afraid, and they drew near and came. Every, everyone helped his neighbor and said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. And he who smooths with the hammer inspired him who strikes the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. Then he fastened it with pegs that it might not totter. And so what's happening is the nations um, are reacting by strengthening their idols. Uh, they're building their idols, they're building their, their images, um, they're encouraging the, uh, the metal workers um, to make these images so they can uh, make their gods stronger in hopes that their gods will defend them. And then in verses 8 through 20, God tells his people not to fear. God, uh, God's servant, in verse 8, but you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. So he tells them not to fear. In verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And of course, you know, the prophets often attribute or anamorphi in a anamorphi. Anthropomorphize um, God, of course. Does he have a hand? Does he have an arm? Okay, he's spirit. So this is a symbol of of strength and dominance and and, um, and overpowering. The right hand is a symbol of power, and so it's uh, it's that with which he's going to uphold his his people with his righteous right hand. You you, you get the picture of a, a glorious king. Um, a defender, a warrior. And so this, this language is meant to encourage Israel. Um, and in verses 11 through 12, Behold, all those who are incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced and shall be as nothing. In verse 12, you shall seek them and find them not. Those who contended with you, those who war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. And so, you know, throughout the... This book, you get the picture of the enemies of, of Israel, the enemies of God, are going to be accounted to nothing, utterly destroyed. And here is a little, it, it seems a little more um, annihilistic, you know, if you will. So, saying to the enemies of God shall be as nothing shall be as a non-existent thing. And it, it seems to me, anyway, whenever you talk about the future hope of the Messiah and the future kingdom of God, it's hard, it's hard to leave out the future judgment, you know, that comes from God in the, in the meantime. And it's a reminder um, that ultimately, although they didn't, they didn't realize ultimately in the prophets, yes, Babylon was defeated, the enemies of God were defeated, and a type of peace was established again. They returned to the temple, they rebuilt the walls, you know, as we read in the Bible. But ultimately, the judgment of God 
as a whole, universal, as yet to come. And when we look at the, the judgment of God on the enemies of Israel through the Old Testament, it, it gives us a picture. You know, it kind of gives us an image of what the final judgment is finally going to be realized, that the enemies of God will be counted as nothing. They will be like a non-existent thing. Um, I don't think it's saying that they're going to be erased out of history, but it's an image of the ultimate judgment that is goes along with the ultimate hope for God's people, because they go hand in hand. And whenever it talks about the ultimate hope for God's people future, you know, the New Testament is clear about, you know, the other side of that also is the, um, the condemnation to those who are, uh, who do not know God, who do not obey the gospel. Um, this language is meant to stir up hope, you know, for God's people to enable them to be bold uh, and not fear um, in verse 15, because they, they're weak, it says, Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat, beat them small and make the hills like chaff. Um, it's like a, a rebuilding of strength, you know, of their armament, because they're, they're a weak people easily overtaken by, by other nations at this point. They're going to be taken over by various nations for the next several hundred years and they need to be strengthened and so God will remember his people in in their their darkest hour it says in verses 17 through 20 when the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongues fail for thirst I the Lord will hear them I the God of Israel will not forsake them I will open rivers and desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys, and I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree, and I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, and the Holy One of Israel has created it. So you get a picture of deliverance and, and nourishment, replenishment. Of course, the, the image of, of water springing from the wilderness and from the desert, um, it really hits home as far as the words of Jesus said. You know, I, you know, I, uh, I am the living one, you know, and uh, he, tell, he told the Canaanite woman that, if, you know, if you would ask, then I would give you water, you know, springing up uh, like living water. And whenever there's the image of those poor and needy people, you have the deliverance and the provision uh, that guides. Adding overall to this uh, message of encouragement and hope for the future. Okay. Um, we can't forget that, you know, this does not discount or take away the impending uh, wrath of God or punishment of God or exile of God's people into foreign hands. But this does present uh, God as fulfilling his promise to uh, bless the children of Israel. <laughs> That would be it. and those yeah. will be as the enemy of God. And Paul says the same thing in Romans, you know, where he uses Isaiah quite a lot, and he talks about Israel and you know why Israel didn't choose God and why they didn't hear God's word, and and they're being it's like they're being punished and, and exiled, and it's not like they didn't have a chance to hear God's word. They did. But then he quotes Isaiah when he says um, that God's people will be as the sand of the seashore, but it's the remnant that will be saved. Um, the remnant are those who 
worship God in spirit and truth today. Um, the remnant in Israel's time um, are those who are going to come out of captivity and after 70 years of Babylonian captivity are going to get to go back home. And it's a, it's a reminder that you know, God does not forget his faithful people no matter what the condition of the world or the nation as a whole is. Uh, even if you live in a godless nation and one that exalts idolatry and immorality, if you're faithful to God, uh, he has not forgotten you, and he will bring you out of exile and, and send you back to a place where there is provision and his guidance and, uh, and where he is. Is there any comments? Chapter 42, as we move forward, the theme of that chapter is the Lord will take care of his people as we continue to think um, a little further. Chapters 42 and 43 uh, are essentially devoted to saying that God will deliver his, his people. Um, deliverance from Babylon is the subject for Israel at the time, um, there is also deliverance through the Messiah. It talks about in the first nine verses of chapter uh, 42, as the Messiah is referred to, uh, my servant, the elect one, in verse one, the elect one in verse one, I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to who? The Gentiles, okay, obviously not the current state of, of, um, of Israel. But it's interesting that this starts the process of the Gentile um, justice as it is. Um, justice, you know, when we're talking about justice, involves law, right? And there cannot be justice without law. And so when we talk about bringing justice forth to the Gentiles, he's not talking about the law of Moses. Okay? He's not talking about proselytes from other nations who are going to be converted to Jews. He's looking forward to a time where God's law, not the law of Moses, but God's law will be with the Gentiles also. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. Again, more of the same that we find in the New Testament describing um, Jesus. And when these verses are quoted here, Let's look at Matthew 3 and 17. This word, elect, my elect one. It says in verse 17 of chapter 3, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my Beloved son with whom I am well pleased. But also, turn, turn over to Matthew 17 and verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And so when we think about my elect one in whom my soul delights, that's exactly what we're talking about. Well pleased. And, and the Father says that throughout the New Testament. And he says that here in, in chapter 42 
which you know points to Jesus. So we're gonna we're gonna start back there next time, and we're gonna try to pinpoint a little little more where it connects to the, the New Testament with these prophecies.